Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast, Our New Narrative. And today is June 2nd, and I we have our guest Leo Washington here today with us, and we're gonna talk about um two things. One Robert Johnson's proposal for $14 trillion worth of reparations to the descendants of slaves in America. And this young man named Chazil Sun's YouTube video. He was a former Black Lives Matter uh, for Ferguson organizer, and he intends or wants to expose the Black Lives Matter. Matter movement, the Democrats, and Antifa. So with that said, I want before me and Leo get started, I want to remind you to like, share, and subscribe. If you find something useful out of this um, chat me and Leo are doing, uh, please, again, like, share, and subscribe so we can keep bringing this content to you. So with that said, on to the $14 trillion dollars which equates to about $350,000 to me and Leo a piece and the uh, rest of the 40 million African Americans in the country. So, woohoo, me and Leo about to get paid, <laughs> and with that comes a target on our forehead or a target on our back. So, uh, we're going to talk about that. So, two, there's two, oh, Along with slavery, reparations for slavery, there's reparations for de jure and de facto discrimination, um, talking about the Jim Crow laws and, you know, housing discrimination and stuff like that. So with that said, there's always two uh, issues to the reparate to me, two issues to the reparation question. And one is a legal question. The other is a moral question. And when you go... If you're talking about legal, I guess, you know, the you can approach it in the court of law or the court of equity. And you hear that term tossed around a lot. We want equity because basically you ain't getting nowhere in the court of law with this. One, because who are you going to sue? Uh, some people say, well, you know, you can sue some companies who benefited from slavery, some insurance companies who insured slave ships, um, the descendants of families who owned slaves. Um, but I'm pretty sure they don't have $14 trillion to <laughs> give out to anybody. And on the equity side, which is more of a moral, like, okay, legally, we can't really do anything, but morally, is an injustice has been done. So we'll take this to the court of equity and and maybe they can do something with it. Well, that has more of a leg, but even to me, it, it goes nowhere either because, again, it assumes a lot. And the assumption is, I'm just speaking about slavery at this point. We'll get to racism, de facto <clears throat> segregation and all that stuff in a minute. But as far as the institution of slavery and those who uh, were victimized by it, if you're going to go to a court of equity, well, how far are you going back? Because there were white slaves in America, along with white indentured servants. There were black indentured servants along with black slaves. So where's your cutoff? And, and if you're going that far back, well, that's the colonial. <laughs> Those are the colonial governments of, their, of the colonies, which belong to England. So are you, involved, are you going to put England in that lawsuit as well? And I know England, don't, if we don't have $14 trillion, England don't have $14 trillion. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're going to go back to England, then you're like, well... You know, you have to include, now you're talking about the slave trade, right? And the slave trade involved Europeans and Africans. But my, one of my big gripes about this subject is we just give a, no one ever talks about the Africans who sold Africans 
to the Europeans. So now, are you going to involve in this lawsuit the Africans who sold other Africans into the slave trade? Well, I know they don't have $14 trillion to give anybody because they ain't around no more, right? And if the descendants of those who sold their own people into slavery are around, they don't have $14 trillion. And and if you're talking about, well, you know, the people who are victimized by the institution of slavery, well, how come you exclude white Christian slaves? It was more, it was like millions of white Christian slaves. Although this happened before America was founded, but so were the 13 colonies. That that wasn't America, 1619 to 1776. That was, we were an English colony. So how far back do you go and who do you include? And why are you excluding all victims of slavery except for those of African descent who happen to live in America? And do the descendants of black people who owned slaves fought in the Confederate war, bought Confederate bonds to support the war, do their children or their descendants get reparations as well? I think it's a non-issue, a non-starter. It's just a political point to divide. That's, it's just a political tactic, um, another way to usher in some type of social pro- program, but I digress. And I'm going to let Lee, before I just go out on a rant and tangent, I'm going to ask Leo what he thinks about the legal side and the moral side of reparations. Well, um, I guess on the comedic side of Chris Rock asking that question when he had a cable show. Uh, some, some many years before, before where he was asking, asking random, random people, people on the street who happened to be <laughs> our white American brethren, A, B, and C type of question about what they thought about reparations. And C was pretty much kiss my ass. They all big kiss my ass in true American fashion. So they, they basically said that's going to be a non star because it, to, to them, them just, just right, right off the cuff, cuff made, made no, no sense, sense to them, to them, them at all. all. Um, and, and you have laid out at least the A, B, and some other A, B, and C points, points about, well, structurally, structurally how, how would you even structure, structure that kind of argument to be a legal argument for anything? anything. So, so it's just, just kind of like, like you, you can't, can't really go forward on, on that simply because the legal basis wouldn't even be there. And I don't even think a group, a group of attorneys, attorneys who, who you, know, you know, regardless of what their ethnicity they were, would get together and try and champion, champion that to present it what, to, the to the court, court to a court, court somewhere. somewhere. Well, as a graduate of law school, I can guarantee you there'll be some attorney trying to do Somebody that. Somebody? <laughs> for, <laughs> for the money? Hey, a $14 trillion payout. Yeah. I, <laughs> somebody with $14 trillion? <laughs> yeah, 40% of $14 trillion. Yeah, okay, right. <laughs> nah, but, yeah, man. Nah. It's a, it's a non-starter, and again, like it, not to say or not to dismiss the the horrors of slavery or the injustice of slavery, but um, I think this is another just political rule, so to speak. Um, and another thing, like like I said before, before we start recording this. Okay, me and Leo get $350,000, a cash check, right? I'm assuming it won't be a cash check, but let's just say 40 million people get who identify as African-American get a $350,000 check. You just put 40 million people in what's considered today the 1%. And if I get that check on Monday, I'm buying all the gold and silver I possibly can because on Wednesday, with all that hyperinflation, an apple is going to cost you 
you know, fifteen hundred dollars or a thousand. Right. <laughs> right. So Immediately fifteen hundred dollars. So you gonna destroy the savings of all white Americans who saved, if anybody is saving nowadays, and black Americans who say because you're gonna de- basically destroy the value of our currency by doing that. Now that's a discussion for another day, but just take my word for it. If you're gonna print up fourteen trillion dollars in addition to what we just print up like for three or four trillion dollars because of this yeah. corona thing you're talking about zimbabwe uh weimar republic where you know people just taking wheelbarrows full of money and leaving them outside and coming out to find out somebody that stole the wheelbarrow and <laughs> left all the money <laughs> the <laughs> wheelbarrows worth, worth more, more than, than the money, money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it just, I mean, conversation, well, just the fact that you got a prominent man like Robert Johnson talking about something which I consider idiotic, uh, and pe- he's on CNBC and they're taking him seriously enough to allow him to present it, goes to show you how much we don't know about slavery. And me and Leo talk about this all the time. And it's my belief that this is not coincidental that you know right now we're for example right now we're we got COVID-19 going on you got riots going on where there was protests that you know for some reason turn to riots when the sun go down so the, the protesters turn into vampires I don't know uh, but <laughs> you know, for some reason they everybody got mask on, right? You might as well start protesting during the day, but no, uh, I mean start rioting during the day because everybody at night. So you know they're illegitimate if they gonna wait till the sun go down, run around the corner, put on a black uniform with gas masks and hats, and start you know robbing and stealing. Basically, this is that has nothing to do with racism. That has everything to do with anti-capitalists um, trying to, you know, just destroy us from within like a bunch of termites. So with that said, the reason they're able to do that and the reason we're all like being bamboozled right now is because instead of being educated at school about our history, when I say our history, I mean all American history, um, we've just been indoctrinated to believe this narrative of victimization. People looking like me and Leo are just born victims and people who don't look like us are born victimizers and nothing we can do. Uh, that's this. And because of that, let's thank Andre for being black by giving him, <laughs> you know, 350 k and, and you're, you're not, not, you're, you're saying, saying that rhetorically. rhetorically. You're yeah. not saying that that should be right. what's, what's done, done like at all. all. Right. At all. Now, here we go with the history lesson, folks. I wish... You know, like your boy uh, Eddie Murphy on Saturday Night Live. I really wish I had a, a stand here and I could write out the word. <laughs> and I could say something like, today's word, boys and girls. Mr. Robinson's <laughs> name was uh... <laughs> that, that was, was the, the best L, right? <laughs> yeah. right. Hey, hey, boys, boys and, and girls, girls. <laughs> today's word is reformation. You know, right. <laughs> now, uh, let's talk about the slave trade, right? Because that's near and dear to all of us. And honestly, a lot of these people, like I was saying earlier, man, when I saw the protest marchers in uh, Chicago yesterday on the news, I was like, man, I ain't seen that many people marching in the streets of Chicago or just in the streets of Chicago since the Bulls won with Michael Jordan. And this is during a pandemic where everybody, you know, with Corona. So it's near and dear to a lot of people's hearts what happened to Mr. Floyd, uh, George Floyd. Um, And a lot of those people in that crowd were white Americans along with their black brothers and sisters and Hispanic and Asian and others. Right. So it's, it's important to me that we all understand our real history and not this indoctrination we've been getting for the past a past past few generations. And I'm a I'ma just rattle off some facts um, from a book 
that if you've seen any of my other, uh, any other other our narrative, our new narrative podcast, I often talk about this. It's called the history of slavery. I'm just gonna put it up like that. I don't know if you can see it, but it's called the history of slavery. No, nah, you can't see it. I don't know. Written by. Written by Mr. William Blake or Blake W O. <laughs> so this is back when in the day. The yeah, the initial. <laughs> so just look it up. You can Google it. It's free. It was copied. It was. It came out published in um, eighteen fifty nine. 1859. So this book was written before the Civil War. Uh, wow. And it's full of um, congressional congressional records, congressional hearings. Uh, it goes back to the slave slavery in um, Rome, Athens, Sparta, like all the way up through, uh, it talks about white Christian slavery, talks about, um, you know, slavery in the colonies. And what, and, and, and the European slave trade with Africa, which is to what we're talking about today. So today, boys and girls, we're talking about European slave trade with Africa, <laughs> which, which started with a guy named Antonio Gonzalez from uh, Portugal. Yeah. So this... I don't want to get my dates right wrong here, but it was early. It was like 14. I wrote it down here. Ah, you see. The gray hairs aren't for nothing, man. I'm... <laughs> Listen to you. <laughs> it's, uh... You ain't the only one with them. <laughs> <laughs> it was like 1430, I think. Um, maybe if I can't find it. Oh, here it is. Um, anyway, 14, it's around 1430 or something like that. Um, Antonio Gonzalez went to Guinea and sailed up to Guinea and he was a trader for Portugal and he got a whole bunch of cargo. Along with that cargo, he got two African slaves, a boy and a girl, and he sailed to Spain. And guess who he sold the slaves to? Leo. Drum roll. The queen? <laughs> no, he sold them to a Moore's family. M-O-O-R-S. Okay. So the first documented transaction of European slave trade, what kicked it off was these were the following actors. Two Africans who got sold to a Portuguese person by other Africans. That Portuguese sailor, Antonio Gonzalez, went to Spain and sold those people to Moors, right? And from there is where you get the slave trade. And it was a trickle, just a trickle until, and it picked up steam when Christopher Columbus uh, discovered, well not discovered, but ran up on uh, Hispaniola, Hispaniola, which- Hispaniola. Is, yeah, Hispaniola, which is modern day Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And even then, uh, the slave trade didn't really kick off. Because you're talking Christopher Columbus, 1492, uh, the Atlantic slave trade didn't pick up full steam for a while. I mean, you know, and I, I don't want to get too deep into that. But we have, right now we're talking about the slave trade. So you got the first actors of that slave trade and then you have England who got involved in the slave trade and they had to give a, um, what would you call it? Um, uh, like a, they gave a mon monopoly to a certain company so that they could do the slave trade. Right. And then, oh, so they basically granted a charter. Yeah, charter. That's the word I was looking for. They granted, and and you can find all this stuff, and you can Google that. Uh, but when that charter, they opened that charter up to everybody. They they took away that charter. Was it the East African Company, I believe, 
they took away that charter and oh. everybody, that's when the slave trade really started to pick up. But with all that said, when you're talking about reparations for the descendants of slaves in America, typically people start with 1619. Um, and even then, there was no such thing as perpetual slave. So you were a slave for a minute, not a minute, but you were a slave for you know, seven, eight years, or you were in ditch or servant, but you weren't a slave for life. Um, that happened after Anthony Johnson, who was a former indentured servant, uh, earned his freedom or ended his, con got, you know, paid off his contract, whatever. Uh, he became a landowner granted to him by the state of Virginia. And he was able to get white indentured servants and black indentured servants. And one of those was John Cesar. And John Cesar complained to a white guy, I think his name was Robert Shipman. I could be wrong about that, but you can look this up. You can Google that as well. And he complained to him saying his indentured servitude with um, uh, Anthony Johnson was over seven years ago. And so basically the white guy interceded Anthony Johnson ended up suing the white guy. Uh, Anthony Johnson lost initially, and Anthony Johnson appealed, won, and that case ushered in perpetual slavery. So do we sue Anthony Johnson? I mean, do we consider him? Most people don't even know him. So that's another example to me of how disingenuous this argument is. Another example of how disingenuous this argument is and how we just go to school to be indoctrinated into, you know, victimization. Uh, you have, you know, blacks who owned other slaves, and not because they hated black people, but because the institution of slavery was just what it was. It was the oldest institution known to mankind. It's not like these people were driving up to McDonald's drive through and kidnapping people and throwing them in the uh, cotton fields. Like if you were in Africa and you weren't a chief, uh, someone of importance who owned, you know, a you know, I would say anywhere in the world, especially back in um, like 13, 14, 1500s, right? What were your labor options, <laughs> right? I mean, in America, we our image of the institution of slavery, which dates back like 9,000 years before any European ever stepped foot on American soil. Our only real image of that is, you know, what Kutukete went through during Roots. And that was horrible, and a lot of horrible things did happen to a lot of, a lot of people, black, white, Chinese, enslaved, Tons of people right now, there's still slavery going on today. So it's not to say, not again, not being dismissive or mediating the circumstances of the individual slaves, but I think when all you do is preach a doctrine in, edu in our educational schools of victimization and, you know, you owe us this type of mentality. What's that called, Leo? Like uh, entitlement, right? We, yeah. Entitlement and, vic and, victim and victimization, that allows you to come up with uh, a proposal for $14 trillion worth of reparations and people take it seriously or at least consider From a billionaire, my From a billionaire. Yeah. So, again, this... In my opinion, and I'll talk about this in other videos, uh, this is a political ploy. It is connected with what's going on with these riots uh, that's basically being insinuated by the group my man Chazelle Sons was talking about, a former... Black Lives Matter, Fort Ferguson. And I didn't get the other group name. And that he was the Black RG Lives Matter, the, the ones I know. He, he was saying he another name. name. RGB. Yeah, yeah, Some right. Now, I'm not too familiar with that one. And I didn't have a chance, chance to, look to look it up, it up either, either, but I was like, yeah. he kept, kept saying, saying this other, other 
acronym, acronym and I was like, well, I've, I've never, never heard, heard of that. that. Right. So, but basically, you got to find out what group that is he's talking, talking about. But Right. Basically, the gist of what he was talking about is that he believes the Black Lives Matter movement has been infiltrate, inf, infiltrated and taken over. And he, you know, comments on who funds this organization, uh, basically left leaning people and organizers and people and organizations who don't really care about the African American community. Um, and he's telling those who will listen to basically think about. And that's instead of just sitting there being indoctrinated by the media, think about it or read some stuff. And I always recommend reading things. I don't know if you guys can see this book because of my virtual green screen. But reading history that was written around the time of the historical events, because what I've come to see is that what we've been taught in school is almost totally different from what's being the common knowledge, basically, of what's mm -hmm. what we what we come to know as common knowledge today. So if they wrote it around the historical, historical period, it's, it's a lot, lot truer, truer to the facts than, than it, it is the further out, out you get from it. Yeah, because then you're just interpreting something that happened, you know, 200 years ago or whatever. Like today, my perfect example, one of the perfect examples is, and I don't want to get too far away from this Black Lives Matter and Antifa thing, but one of my favorite examples is our, how we think about Thomas Jefferson, right? Well, he was a founding father, but he was a racist asshole, right? And I'm like, well, it's more complex than that because although he did own slaves, and he had a relationship with one of his slaves, which everybody just assumed he raped her enough time to have how many kids? Like, like seven or eight, something. Seven or eight kids, man. So, and we weren't there. So I'm just, I'll get a man a benefit of the doubt. Why? Because I've read some of his personal writings where he is basically calling black people in America, his brethren, his brethren, citizens, uh, the original draft of the Declaration of Independence, which every American should go out there and read, and you can find that on Google as well, where it, uh, you know, that, that phrase, all men are created equal, refers to not just those trying to get away from uh, England, but to blacks as well. And he, he basically goes off on the, the monarchy of England for trying to, every time the colonists tried to impose either duties so high that it would basically eliminate slavery in the colonies or get rid of slavery in the colonies, the monarchy of England would put a squash to that. So here we are 200, 300 years later, and all we think about Jefferson is he, he was just a slave-owning asshole who raped his, who raped his woman, woman enough time to have seven kids. <laughs> So just like my man said, think, think it through a little bit. I know based on the information you have and what you've been taught in indoctrination school, that may be true. But if you go and read it for yourself, you will find that you've been lied to and I've been lied to as well. But the truth is out there, like they said. Mulder said, the truth is out there, right, from a... Uh, X Files, uh, X -Files uh, reference, reference thrown in. Yeah, the truth is out there. And you have to think of this too. Malumissions, the freeing of slaves. So if you freed slaves, one of the arguments against freeing slaves wasn't that we hate all black people, but those who wanted to free slaves but didn't free slaves, one of the main obstacles to freeing slaves was the fact that you couldn't free slaves unless you get like permissions from a governor at a certain point. Now, slavery in America goes like from 1600s through 1850. So things changed a lot and you had different colonies with different laws. So this isn't a blanket statement, but to free a slave wasn't just like, all right, peace, Woodrow, you know, <laughs> go ahead, dude, you're free to go. No, because look, they had no money, no property. And if they were free, this, the 
felony will have to take care of a lot of them. So they will be, instead of being the responsibility to house and feed, instead of it being the responsibility of a private citizen, will become the private the responsibility of the community. And a lot of people didn't want that. And that was a that was an argument for a lot of the northern states not wanting an influx of of slaves into their communities because you know you just got a bunch of people with no skills no way to earn a living uh no nothing you know so what did it they they were like we don't want that and that's under kind of almost like a river yeah yeah exactly so but we're not taught that we're taught that the people even the white people in the north they just hated all black people and it's just more complex than that. And I think it does all of America dis- a disservice. And it allows, once again, stuff like a $14 trillion reparation proposal to be taken halfway or seriously enough to be on CB- CNBC, right? And- again, because it, it keeps cropping, cropping up, up every, every decade. decade. It's resurfaced. Every yeah. And it, it'll never happen, one, because America doesn't have any money. Not because we're broke, but America, the U.S. government doesn't have money. You know what I mean? Like the United States doesn't make cars or gym shoes or TVs. Hell, the, the United States don't make money. The money comes from the Federal Reserve Bank, which needs, which we borrow, the United States borrow, and me and Leo pay back as taxpayers. So on to my man who's kind of who wants to expose the Black Lives Matter movement and Antifa. He's basically saying that, you know, they don't they're not really for the the cause he was signing up for, which was uh, perceived, um, you know, problems with racial discrimination in America. And that's another uh, video will do, but here you got a young man in dreads. It looks like he's smoking a blunt to me, so I don't know. I don't know. If, uh, <laughs> I know, I know he's chilling, chilling on the porch. porch. He's chilling on the porch with the with the, with the wife yeah, beat around, yeah, speaking <laughs> the truth, and maybe he'll uh, appeal to a certain audience. Because when I watched the video yesterday, bro, at like eight p.m. Pacific Standard Time, he had four thousand views. I'm looking at this thing now, and I'll refresh it. And this is less than 24 hours later. He got like some road. He got like man, I got 30, almost 32,000 views, bro. It went up even more. (laughs) Went up even more. And again, I'm gonna keep, you know. I should let you talk. I've just been talking. But I I do want to throw in another book. The Impending Crisis of the South and How to Meet It. Uh, There we go. The Impending Crisis of the South and How to Meet It. This is by Hinton Boer Helper. And this was written in, I think, 1857. Trying to find a copy copyright on this uh, it's in, I got two copies of this but 1857 and this is one of my favorite books of all time one this book was outlawed in the south it'll get you killed it'll get you killed <laughs> you can google it three people in Arkansas got hanged for having this book and why because it blew out the narrative that the Southerners were pushing to protect the institution of slavery. One of their biggest narratives was cotton is king. And it with stats from the US government just blew that out of the water. And what's really sad is that same narrative is being used today to promote (laughs) reparations uh, for the descendants of slaves. It is is really, it's mind blowing how uneducated we are as a country over an issue that has people rioting in the streets, right? It Mm. is mind blowing. It's not like, you know, this dude had this book 
and they sent all the copies to the moon and nobody had access to them. <laughs> it's been suppressed because right. it goes against the narrative. Anything that goes against that narrative of victimization, whatever, just gets suppressed, and then people don't want to talk about it. But what's even better, this book was written by a North Carolinian, proud Southern gentleman, as he says, uh, who was a slave owner. <laughs> and uh, what about favorite? Should I just read this out? It's so hard to read. It's kind of hard. Yeah, really. But I'm going to try, <laughs> man. In the prefix, it says, I'm writing this book. It has been no part of my purpose to cast a merited aporium upon slaveholders or to display any special friendliness or sympathy for the blacks. I have considered my subject more particularly with reference to its economic aspects as regards the whites, not with reference except in a very slight degree to its humanitarian or religious aspects. To the latter side of the equation, Northern writers have already done full and timely justice. And I'm assuming he's, he's talking about uh, Uncle Tom's cabin at this point, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uh, the genius of the North has also most ab ably and eloquently discussed the subject in the form of novels. Yankee wives have written the most popular anti-slavery literature of the day. Against this, I have nothing to say. It is all well enough for women to give fictions of slavery. Men should give the facts. So, wow. Fa I mean, statistics, I mean, everything, man, like, that would end it right here. Just read this book, and you'll just be like, okay, well, I don't know. What did you say earlier, uh, Leo? A show about nothing? Like, it'd be stupid. Yeah. <laughs> I feel part two. Like, ain't nothing to talk about, man. Like, just one statistic on here. Like, the, the city of New York in 1850, I believe it is. So this is like 10 years before... 10, 11 years before the Civil War. Civil War, yeah. Everybody heated about slavery. And this is around the time where Cotton is King, Cotton is King is coming around. There's statistics from, you know, if you want to use U.S. statistics as a credible source, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. What else you going to do? Right? Show that the city of New York was worth more than the whole state of North Carolina, including. That's crazy. The slaves, which made up half of the North Carolina population. Like, so something economically ain't right. It ain't right, bro. And in this book, you have the original, um, the original Declaration of Independence. And you see, I mean, everything they use, like the three-fifths thing argument that, oh, black folks were thought of as three-fifths human, blows it out of the water. Man, if it wasn't for that three fifths human thing, we probably still be in chains, man. Because wow. <laughs> to curb the power of the Southerners, right? You curb the power of the Southerners. They had to, you know, to get this union together to fight against England. You had to come together as a union. The only way they could do that was to say because the the Southerners wanted all their slaves to count as one person. But one of the best quote, one of the best things I ever read was out of this book was when the northerner was like, all right, Dan, well, since you counting all your people you claim to be property, right? You're going to claim all them. We're going to start claiming our chair. Property. Our I remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> the desk. <laughs> the desk, right? So they compromised and thank God, at least for that, right? Um, so that helped that helped the abolitionist movement uh, that eventually ended up uh, getting, you know, leading to a civil war that ended up uh, into slavery in America. So, again, I think when anytime you hear about reparations, don't let your emotions get away from you. I just gave you two books that are free. Now, they're dense. I'll give you that. But if it's that important to you, man, if you out there protesting for racial injustices, you need to know what you 
protesting about. You need to really know, not what some actor told you about or, you know, some news pundit whose producer is whispering in his ear what to say or what telling her what to say. You can get the truth from the source and it's out there. And like my man Leo always say, get mad in the right direction. That's right. If you're going to be mad, get mad in the right direction. Yeah. But Chazil is trying to talk about that, right? Yeah. I mean, he's saying it, not even trying to talk about it. He's going right at it. Yeah. Fifteen he's... minutes he was on it. Yeah. I, had like, to I mean, you know, you know, me and you've been talking about this for a long time, but he's he's he was actually in the organization and he knows from firsthand knowledge. Me and you are seeing it from the outside looking in, and I've been on this. You know, like this, it just doesn't make sense, man. Like, people have known. I grew up in Detroit with riot. I I missed the '68 riots, but I was around for the Malice Green. In Detroit. you can look that up, the Malice Green riots. I don't know if it was a riot, but a skirmish. Then you had the L.A. riots. Then you had the Ferguson riots and all this stuff, man. And and it's just us destroying our communities and. Now it's being exposed a bit more that you have organizations like Antifa who are basically inciting uh, riotous behavior, Um, you know, fanning the flames of black people who perceive social injustice so that they can get in and destroy the country from within. I mean, me and Leo, we're just... I mean, you were just talking about this a little earlier. You know, isn't this isn't this coincidental that we have a coronavirus that shuts the country down and 40 million people are unemployed and everybody gets a stimulus check? Everybody's getting stimulated to stay home. Then everybody's <laughs> unemployed. Then you get this unfortunate killing of this black man. Then everybody leaves the house, even though we're on quarantine. You got people with babies marching in the streets along with Yeah, I saw that. Oh. Who are quarantined. And, you know, so you know what that means. Next week or two weeks, the corona statistics are going to spike up. Oh, God, everybody's going to have to be shut down again. Um, and then what? More unemployment, more businesses closing. The businesses who opened last week the small mom and pops in a lot of these, you know, urban centers, they'll never open up again because they were barely hanging on. And now they don't even have any merchandise. They can't even do a going out of business sale. (laughs) They don't have no- Because somebody just stole their business. They just stole. So you think stuff was mad last week, just wait, (laughs) just keep waiting, man. I mean, it's, it ain't, it's going to get worse before it get better, but um, yeah. Yeah, my thing is how the conflation of different things came together. Like you were saying, is the coronavirus thing and how that, as a health crisis, uh, which we hadn't we hadn't experienced any, you know, plagues because that's basically what that dang thing is. It's a plague. You just don't call it that anymore because it's all biblical and old fashioned sounding. Right. But it's basically a plague. It's not like you can get a shot for it. And that situation dominoed into an economic situation because of it was a health situation. Then it became a, a economic issue. And, you know, you have some civil unrest thrown in there because of the typical, I guess, the, the underlying unresolved issues as far as you know that, that socioeconomic thing which is basically ethnic tensions that are that are there but that's an economic reason for that really it's not so much racial as we talked about it it looks racial because you look at somebody and right. think that they're that much different and it's really like a puppet master situation whereas somebody's controlling this whole thing for political gain and economic uh, power, and it just doesn't present itself and wave his hand at you and go, hi, this is what I am. It's a right. deep-seated puppet yeah, man, Wizard of Oz level stuff going exactly, on. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it's this is, um, this uh, you know, things won't change for the better overnight because this has been going on 
like I say all the time, and I'm going to wrap this up right quick, but, and if you stuck around this long, make sure you like, share, subscribe. Uh, yeah, amen. <laughs> <laughs> but I say um, all the time, I ain't say it, but in another book called Reconstruction, Americans Unfinished Revolution, there's a, they, they have President Johnson, Democratic leader, the leader of the Democratic, lead, uh, the Democratic Party, you know, he came in office after the Republican Lincoln was assassinated. But the people who lost the war, their lead, the leader of that party comes into the off to the off the executive office, the presidency, and he's talking to the postmaster general, and he's saying that now that uh, the war is over, talking about the Civil War, the key to politics is no longer slavery. So. If you were pro-slavery, too bad, there's no more slavery. And if you were against slavery, too bad, there's no more slavery. So the key to politics post-Civil War is race. And you, you can just see it is still that way. So racism in politics has led to the Jim Crow laws. It's not as simple as just all white people hate black people. These were politicians pushing these politics. And we'll talk about that on another podcast. But... Um, we, we need to wrap this up right here, uh, but I highly encourage people to go and check out The Impending Crisis of the South by Hinton Helper and The History of Slavery by Blake W.O. Uh, both of these are free. They're in the public domain. Um, they're dense, but, you know, grab some bourbon or grab some coffee and tea and get through it. <laughs> And uh, be mad in the right direction. And with that, I think we're going to sign off. And as usual, I'm going to put a link in the description to a website that will give you all type of information concerning organizations around the world who are currently fighting the fight against involuntary to slavery and uh, human trafficking. With that, peace.